And hopefully I can contain my announcements to less than 10 minutes, which I apparently struggle to do all the time. And then we'll start into some content. So um, the first announcement, our final exam time is Tuesday, May 18th at 8 a.m. till 10 a.m. Pacific Daylight Time, UTC negative seven. Our final exam time, but there is no final exam. The final exam time is 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. Pacific Daylight Time, UTC negative seven. So that I'm going to count 10 a.m. Tuesday, May 18th as the last time for us to submit any course materials. I'm going to count the end of our final exam time as the last time to submit any course materials. That's labs, two tutorials, and our course notes. The last time to submit our labs, two tutorials, and our course notes is Tuesday, May 18th, 10 a.m. Pacific Daylight Time, UTC, negative seven. Please upload both the R Markdown and the knitted HTML files for all of the appropriate documents to our shared Google Drive folder. So the last time to submit all of our materials, including both the R Markdown documents and the knitted documents, to our shared Google folder is going to be May 18th, 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. If you have some extra plots, please also upload those folders or those files as well. I highly encourage you, even though we're getting to like close to some time in the semester where I won't really have much time to give you good feedback, I can still give you some feedback even if it's not good, it benefits you to even just make sure that you know, confirm with me that all of your files uploaded appropriately. Um, okay, so the first announcement for the day is our final exam period time, even though there is no final exam, is Tuesday, May 18th, 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. I expect you to have all of the materials uploaded to our shared Google Drive folder by then. Both the R Markdown and knitted HTML file for each respective assignment. It's for the tutorials and the course notes. And you should also get your labs in by then. Are there any questions on that? Everyone's clear when, where, and what should be submitted. Chatty day today, huh? Cool. Oh, there's a thumbs up. I see it now. Nice. Okay. Okay. We're getting the thumbs up. <laughs> okay. Then I'm going to move on. I think that was all my updates for the day, which is impressive. I even kept it less than five minutes. It turns out, and I didn't even know this before I gave this same lecture earlier today at 10. It turns out I am stoked about where we're at in this class. I totally am. I thought this was going to be like, you know, I'll kind of do some recap on some things we've seen before. I'll do a little bit of recap of some things we've seen before, but then I'll like kind of merge it into looking at it in a way that like sheds light on things we've seen before and show us how those two tools together makes totally new stuff. But no, this is like the opening of the door to the world of statistics today. This is it. It's a bummer. It has to happen so late in the class. But I feel like we have the tools to go out and understand so much of the world of statistics. This is it. I'm stoked. We are looking towards models. We are starting with the tools we have and looking to statistical models. And that's what we're going to talk about um, this week and next, in fact. I'm going to just take quick looks at three separate models that kind of encapsulate most of the world of applied statistics. So today, I'm going to recap the central limit theorem. 
I'm going to use that to talk about confidence intervals. That's probably where most of today's lecture is going to lie. And then we're going to look at conditional densities again. And I'm going to show you how the central limit theorem plus conditional density really gives us the tools of statistical modeling to date. It's really just these two ideas, which aren't simple, but they're um, not terrible. Putting them together turns out to be incredibly powerful. So today, I'm going to try to open that door for us to this new world of stats. And then all the videos on Wednesday are going to be about two different models. We'll try to do them conceptually and then try to do them in R. I don't go into the total details of the models at all this week, because to be honest, there's classes entirely devoted to these models. And this class is really about the tools behind the models, like the mathematics behind the models, which is great. I actually think coming in with the theory understanding of these models makes you a better applied statistician, but um, that's never the way stats pedagogy goes these days. Anyway, so this today is going to be just kind of opening the door to these statistical models. Wednesday's videos are going to be um, showing you a little bit of some specific models. And then next week is going to be some new material, but I'm really trying to keep it on the light side because um, I don't believe in dead week, but a lot of people do. So I try to play the middle ground, which is cover new material, but I keep it light. So let's start the last two weeks of content for the semester by recapping the central limit theorem. And please do interject or say something or type something into the chat when whatever I'm talking about um, for the central limit theorem doesn't quite fit with your thinking of the central limit theorem. I want to ensure we are all on the same page here. So the central limit theorem, there's actually multiple versions of it. So I should probably say a central limit theorem, but that's okay. The central limit theorem dictates, how many T's are in dictates? Let's fix that. Dictates the shape of the distribution of the sample mean. So this is really the point where I think this class started to get um, a little bit abstract was the point where we started thinking about the sample mean as a random variable. So the setting goes like this. Assume you have capital N, it's not all obviously, capital N random variables that follow some distribution. Let's call it F, but later on I'll give this a name. But for now, we don't care what distribution the original data come from. Normal, gamma, binomial, Bernoulli, any other things that have names, but we haven't actually heard of. What we care about is the data are independent and identically distributed. Let me just give us a brief recap of those words. The first I here means independent. Now recall, independent means you can take any two densities and multiply them together to find the joint density of those two random variables. Independent, the first I here, means to find the joint density, you can multiply together the two marginal densities. To find the joint density, you multiply together the individual densities. Okay, that's what independent means. And identically distributed means they both, they all come from the same distribution. So your capital N random variables are all coming from the same distribution. We'll call it S, but later on we'll give it a name. And they're independent. So you can find the joint density by multiplying together individual densities. So if you have these data, then 
the following singular random variable, and that's the crazy part here. This is now an individual random variable follows approximately the normal distribution. And that's the crazy thing about the central limit theorem. If you take some original data, no matter where it came from, no matter what distribution generated that data, then the mean, the sample mean, that is add up all the data points and divide by however many there are, is a new random variable. What we're to think of is any function of random variables is a random variable. Any functions of random variables is itself a random variable. And this new random variable follows approximately the normal distribution, no matter what this distribution is, that gives you the original data. Okay, so interrupt when you need to. Now, we assume that the original data all came from the same distribution. And they all have the same mean, let's call it mu. And they all have the same variance, let's call it sigma squared. So if that's the case, that your original data have mean, this is now expectation mean, not data mean, have mean mu and variance sigma squared, then this normal distribution is, is going to be centered at exactly the quantity you're trying to estimate. You're trying to estimate the expectation. So this normal distribution will be centered exactly where you want it to with a variance that looks like this. Sigma squared, that is the variance of the original distribution, divided by however many data points you have. Now that actually turns out to be rather intuitive. It's not at first, but we actually kind of like that. What this variance tells us is if you have a bunch of data and you take the sample mean, you add up all the data points and you divide by however many there are, the variance of this new distribution is going to go to zero as the number of data points goes off to infinity as the number of data points goes off to infinity, this term goes to zero. What does that actually mean? Well, that means that this quantity is estimating this expectation. And if the variance of this new distribution is going to zero, what's happening is the distribution of this normal distribution is getting skinnier, 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 skinnier. The whole distribution is getting skinnier, 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 skinnier but it's still centered at this value, the true mean that you're trying to estimate. So this whole distribution is getting skinnier, 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 till it's exactly the value you're trying to estimate. As soon as your data goes off to the limit, then this estimate becomes perfect. When your sample goes off to infinity, then your estimate becomes exact. When the sample size, however much data you have, when the sample size goes off to infinity, then your estimate of the true expectation, which we're calling mu, becomes exact. Your estimate estimates mu exactly in the limit. Okay, let's try to Imagine this again. I'm gonna to try to repeat a lot of what I just said, but I'm gonna to try to draw different pictures to highlight a different side of it. Okay, so now we're gonna look at confidence intervals. So the idea is we now know the shape of the distribution of the sample mean. We know this quantity is normally distributed with a mean of the thing we're trying to estimate and a variance that depends on how much data we have. So the idea is like this. If you and your thousand friends got together 
and you each took a sample of size 100. Well, then we'd have a distribution that looks normal. It's centered at exactly the thing we're interested in estimating. And it's got such and such a variation, which we call sigma squared over n. On the other hand, if you and your thousand friends got together and took samples of size 10,000, well, then this variance is going to be much smaller because the denominator is now much bigger. So the distribution would be much skinnier. That's not bad. It's a little crooked, but yeah. it would it's still skinnier. be centered. Would it also get taller too? Yeah. So remember, all the distributions have to, all the density functions have to have area underneath them equal to one. So if we're making things skinnier, then it has to get taller so as to maintain area underneath it equal to one. It's a very good thought. It indeed it gets skinnier and taller. And if it gets fatter, it gets shorter. Yeah, very nice. So if instead you and your thousand friends each took samples of size 10,000, then all of your individual means would make a shape. And that shape would be approximately normal with a variance that is smaller because you have more data centered at the true thing you're trying to estimate, the true expectation. But because the distribution is narrower, it's like you're more sure you're, you and your thousand friends estimates are gonna be closer to the true value. Because you have more data, you are more sure on this distribution that your and your thousand friends different estimates are closer to the true expectation when you have more data than when you don't. Okay, I'm gonna try this one third uh, I'm going to try this entire explanation a third time. This time we're going to try to do it in R. So I'm just going to generate a bunch of data as if the sample size were 100. And I'm going to pick a mean of 5.5. So here it is. Here is my 100 data points. And now what happens in the real world is we don't actually know the true mean. So it's almost like this. All we have is the 100 data points, but we don't know the true mean mu. So right now, we know it's 5.5, but just pretend you don't know it's 5.5. All you have is the data. Well, with the data, you can estimate the true expectation. Wow, that actually turns out to be a really good estimate, right? So you can think of it as that's like one of your friends guesses about what this true value is, 4.49. But this distribution that I'm showing over here is actually a distribution of multiple guesses of that expectation. As if you and a thousand of your friends each went out, collected your own data set, calculated your own mean, and then we made a histogram of all of your individual means. Okay, one more time, just because I think, I like to imagine that this helps you understand what this distribution is. It's literally a distribution of sample means from the same population. But notice some of these are kind of far away from the true value, 5.5. Well, the way you fix that is to increase your sample size. So I don't know what to do here because I've only been rounding to one digit, but we just got an estimate that was like right there, right? <laughs> so I'm just gonna write that. Is that it? I'm just 
going to draw it like that. And now the point is, look how much closer my first estimate was when the sample size was that much bigger. Let's try it again. Oh, same idea, right? Look how much closer these estimates are to the true value when the sample size, this 10,000, is bigger than 100 we are much closer to this true value because the distribution is linear, literally that much skinnier. Okay, here's the issue. We know mathematically that each of our guesses of this true expectation, 5.5, is wrong. We know our guesses are wrong. But we want to be able to say we are somewhat confident that our guess is close. So what we actually end up doing is creating a range of numbers. And we create the range of numbers such that we are, you know, some percent sure that the true expectation is within that range. And we create the range of numbers so that it doesn't matter what size our sample is. We create some range of numbers such that we're something like, and I'm just gonna pick a number that is common to the world of statistics, 95% sure that the true mean mu is within this range of numbers. No matter which one of these we got, we wanna be something like 95% sure that the true mean is within the range. So even if we were this 5.7 over here, we still want to be sure that this range that we're gonna create contains the true estimate. Okay, so do you all remember this crazy rule that says if we have a normal distribution with a mean mu and we go one standard deviation below the mean and one standard deviation above the mean, how much area under this density function is in this range? Okay, I'll give 65. you guys five. Super close, it was 68. 68. Yeah, to be honest, I don't actually care whether you memorize it or not because you can figure this out on, on a computer much easier than actually having to remember. Okay, so if we go within one standard deviation, we capture about 68% of the area under the curve. What about if we go two standard deviations? In 95. Perfect. Thank you. I was trying to lead you all into this 95 earlier. So if you go two standard deviations above the mean and two standard deviations below the mean, you're going to capture about 95% of the area under the distribution. So because we know from the central limit theorem that normal distributions follow this pattern, and we know that the sample mean is approximately normal with a variance we know, we know a good way to create this interval. We can literally say, take your best guess and go down two standard deviations and go up two standard deviations. We can literally say, take a guess and go down two standard deviations and go up two standard deviations. And we can use that to create this interval. There's gonna be some lower bound and some upper bound. 
And between those two numbers, we are, in this case, because we're going to create 95% confidence intervals, we will be 95% confident that the true expectation falls within that range. Okay, so let's just try back here in R really quick. So we'll start with our best guess and we'll go down two times. Now let's be careful here. This describes a variance, but on the 68, 95, 99, 7 rule, we're talking about standard deviations. So to account for that, we'd have to take the square root of this fraction. Taking the square root of the fraction gets rid of the square in the numerator and turns into a square root in the denominator. And so we end up with the standard deviation in the numerator divided by the square root of our sample size. So the lower bound is 5.49, which certainly includes 5.5. And the upper bound is 5.53. That is an interval that now captures the true expectation. Okay, let's try one more time. So it's like, even if you only have one sample of data, even if there's only one sample of data, so this is like 999 of your friends flaked out on you and they didn't go collect their own data set you can still come up with a range of values within which you are 95% sure that the true expectation lives. This is a simple pattern of literally using quantiles to estimate this interval for us. Notice all we've done here is picked out two standard deviations. We picked out the value for a lower bound and the value for an upper bound. That gives us the quantiles between which 95% of the most likely values for the true expectation to live. We have literally created an interval within which are the most likely values for the true expectation. We have literally created an interval within which the most likely values for the true expectation exist. Okay, I'm going to pause for just a minute and drink some water. So if it's outside of that range, it's just like an outlier? Sure, we kind of reserve the word outlier for a little bit different idea. But essentially, what that, um, so Jacob, what you're referring to is like that excess 5%. So the way we created this confidence interval was with two right here. And that two leaves out this excess 5% of which I haven't really addressed. But that 5% is really 5% of the time you could create an interval that does not capture the true expectation. That 5% suggests there is some small amount of the time when you create a confidence interval that does not capture the true expectation. Okay, so let me try to explain this to you from a different angle to tell you why that 5% is there. What if I wanted to estimate a true expectation? 
And I wanted a confidence interval. That is, I wanted a range for which I was 100% confident. What if I wanted to create a range of numbers for which I was 100% confident that the true expectation lives? Would I go out away from the mean or would I go in towards the mean? If I wanted to be 100% confident, that my range captures the true expectation. What if I suggest a range to you and you guys tell me the percent confidence that you are, that my proposed range captures the true expectation? Okay, here's the range. Negative infinity to positive infinity. Does that range capture the true expectation? Seems too big, be hard to find. Okay, it certainly is too big, but is the true mean in there somewhere? Yeah. 100% sure. I am 100% sure that the true mean is in between negative infinity and positive infinity. The interval is so wide, it's uninformative. Jared, that's your complaint. The interval, though it is 100% confident, is so wide, it's uninformative. What we're trying to do is trade off 2.5% of the least likely values in the left tail and two and a half percent of the least likely values in the right tail for a narrower interval that is more meaningful. What we're trying to do is give up some of this excess in the tails that we don't actually care about because those are the least likely values anyway for a narrower interval that is more meaningful. And the sacrifice we just made for that is that 5%, Jacob, that you didn't like. And I agree with you, nobody wants that. Everybody wants to be 100% sure. But what I'm suggesting here is there's mandatory trade-offs from intervals that are so wide they're uninformative, even if they're 100% right, down to ranges that are more informative, even if they're sometimes wrong. Uh, I remember doing like some, I think physics labs or something where mm -hmm. we would use this bell curve. And then if the data was outside of it, then we would just like exclude it and call it an outlier. That's what I was kind of going for. Is that like cool. how you use it practically? Yeah, that is closer. Let me see if I can help you see uh, the way you were using it. So you guys were using it on this side of the world, on the data side of the world. So what you were doing was making the claim that this distribution, and let's highlight it, here was normal. You were making the claim that your original data came from the normal distribution. And any data that didn't fit within the like bulk of the data, you said was probably different in some way. And you called it an outlier and you got rid of it. That's a pretty standard move in the world of applied statistics. But we're more talking about the mean of the mean. Correct. In this case, we're talking about an estimate of the true expectation. And so this distribution here is describing the most likely values, at least within the interval, the most likely values for the true expectation to live underneath a distribution that describes the estimates themselves, not the original data. So let's try to make that point a little bit. Uh, let me just try to repeat that point a little bit. 
I'm really trying to emphasize here that there are two different distributions going on. There is a distribution for the original data. And at this point, I have said that we don't care what kind of distribution it is because the central limit theorem does not care what this distribution is for the most part. As long as there's a mean and a variance, this distribution can be basically anything. This distribution describes the original data. We do not care from which distribution the original data came. But once you have your original data and you calculate a mean, this distribution is guaranteed to be the normal distribution based on the central limit theorem. So I'm really trying to emphasize that there are two different distributions here. There's one distribution for the original data, and there's one distribution for the sample mean. So this is the distribution for original data. And for the most part, we don't care what distribution it comes from. This distribution, you do not pick. The central limit theorem dictates, like you can't deny the central limit theorem. It is a mathematical truth that this distribution is approximately normal. There are two different distributions going on here, one that describes the original data and one that describes the sample means, plural, as if you and your friends each took your own sample of size n and each calculated your own mean. That's never what happens in the real world, but that is what this distribution is describing. There are other follow-up questions before I move on. You want me to ask you guys like a conceptual checkpoint question? Yeah, Edward, that sounds really good. Let's do that. Okay. Okay, given this page, if I wanted to make more narrow my confidence interval while fixing the 95%, if I fix 95%, don't change the percent confident. If I fix the 95%, how can I make this interval more narrow? Given this expression, how can I make this interval more narrow? Just increase the sample size. That's exactly it. The only way to change the width of the confidence interval is by increasing the sample size. If you increase the sample size, the variance gets smaller, and so the distribution collapses in and gets narrower. If you increase the sample size, the variance gets narrower. The variance gets smaller, so the whole distribution gets narrower. But notice, if you increase the sample size, you have not in any way changed this distribution. So another way to see that these two distributions are different is by increasing the sample size, this distribution stays the same and this distribution gets narrower. That's another like checkpoint that these are two different distributions. This one will get narrower as the sample size goes up which is what you intuitively imagine. If you have more data, your estimate will be more accurate. But if your sample size goes up, this distribution over here that governs the original data has not changed at all. Okay, here we go. Here's the next point. In the world of applied statistics, just as Jacob just mentioned, this distribution is often assumed to be a normal distribution also. 
And the world of applied statistics doesn't do that just to confuse you. The world of applied statistics provides logic that says, look, if we don't care what this distribution is because the central limit theorem doesn't care what it is, then we might as well assume it to be normal because it's gonna be normal in the end if we're looking for a sample mean anyway. So the logic is like this. If this distribution is normal and we assume it to be normal, yay us. If we assume this distribution to be normal and it's not actually normal, who cares? The central limit theorem is gonna tell us this, is this sample mean is approximately normal anyway, even if our assumption is wrong. If we assume the distribution that gave us the original data is approximately normal and we are wrong, the central limit theorem isn't like, well, you guys are wrong, so I'm not gonna do my thing for you. The central limit theorem does its thing no matter what. So even if your assumption about this distribution is wrong, you assumed it to be normal and it's not, well then, the central limit theorem tells us that the sample mean is approximately normal anyway. So we might as well assume it to be normal. We might as well assume the distribution of the original data to be normal. Not everybody in the world of statistics uses that logic, but most people do. And so next up, I'm gonna bring in conditional densities. Now this page is going to be about conditional densities, but I'm gonna to try to give you some logic based on a non-conditional density. I'm gonna to try to contrast conditional densities to non-conditional densities and emphasize what conditional densities are bringing to the table for us through the contrast. So if we have a random variable that is normally distributed and it has an expectation mu, well, then we could write it out like this. But the point I really want to make here is that this is just a placeholder. This is just some variable. The name mu is just the common choice but it doesn't have to be the name mu. This is just a placeholder variable. Let me see if I can make an analogy here. Do you all remember the point in your math career where you realized it doesn't matter what the argument to the function is. What really matters is there is some variable and its quantity is being squared. It doesn't matter if we call it X or Y. It's just some value whose quantity is being squared. That's the exact same argument I'm making here. Mu is a placeholder. Okay, so with that in mind, somebody give me a variable name. Um, a. You got it. A it is. there is a mathematical convenience to normal distributions that basically says this is just a placeholder. Whatever is here is the expectation. Whatever is here is the mean of the distribution. It's just a placeholder right there. You can put in whatever you want. So what people have learned to do is say, well, why don't we use that placeholder as the point at which we can relate two random variables? So now we have a random variable y that depends on another random variable 
that's capital X, being equal to some little value, lowercase x. We'll assume it's normal, and maybe we'll assume a relationship that looks linear. Now, this beta naught is meant to be thought of as like an intercept. That's beta subscript zero. And this beta subscript one times x, that's not beta subscript i, that is beta subscript one times x. Beta one is like a slope. So you should be imagining just a line with slope beta one and intercept beta naught. You can literally now, via conditional density, relate two variables. You can literally now specify the expectation of y given another random variable is equal to some value. And in this case, we have specified that there is a relationship that looks like a line dependent on the value of x. OK, so let me make a quick spiel about this, because this turns out to be incredibly powerful. But then maybe a quick example right before class ends about this will be helpful. So let me just make a quick spiel back here. Conditional densities allow us to specify the relationship between two or more variables. That's what conditional densities are allowing us to do. On the other hand, the central limit theorem is quantifying uncertainty about the relationship. So in the world of statistics, we have to rely on data to estimate expectations. We rely on data to estimate expectations. The central limit theorem helps us understand what kind of range of values are most likely in our estimate. The central limit theorem helps us understand the range of values that are most likely in that estimate. But now with conditional densities, we can literally estimate that range of values that are most likely that describe the relationship between two or more variables. We can literally quantify the most likely values that describe a relationship of interest. Okay, so we got like a minute and a half of class left. Let's try to get a really simple example of what this means in the real world. So we can try to understand this conditional density before. So somebody give me a quick numerical variable that you might be interested in in this world. A numerical variable. B. What? B. What is that? No, I'm talking about like US adult heights or um, oh. The prevalence of smoking in a population, or the you know average weight of cats, or something. The stock market, the price of the S and P five hundred tomorrow. Somebody give me an example of some kind of numerical data. There's one in the chat. Yeah. Oh, I missed the chat. Thank you. Number of vaccines administered, perfect. Okay, so if Y is a variable that records the number of vaccines administered, then X could be any number of things. X could be time. So as time goes on, we expect there to be a linear relationship between the number of vaccines administered and time. As time goes up, we expect there to be more vaccines administered. Does that one make sense? 
Yeah. Thanks, Caitlin. Okay, let's keep it again. Gary, this is a really good topic. I appreciate this one. Why could be the proportion of US adults who have received the vaccine? Well, you can start breaking up the proportion of US adults who have received the vaccine into different groups. You could imagine the proportion of US adults who have received the vaccine given, are they an adult or are they a child? At this point in the US, if they're an adult, then the proportion of uh, US people who have received the vaccine is much higher than if they're a child. The way you would think about that in terms of this equation down here on the right is let X be either one or zero. And if it's a one, they're an adult. And if it's a zero, they're a child. So if it's a one, then the proportion that have received the vaccine is beta naught plus beta one. You include the beta one because X is just equal to one. And if they're a child, X is zero. And so the proportion that have received the vaccine is just beta zero. The nice thing about that is beta one directly quantifies the difference between adults and children who have received the vaccine. Gary, I thought that was a really good example. Thank you for typing in that into the chat. Sorry, I missed it at first. I'm gonna stop recording here, but I'll hang out for the next five minutes. But I got a meeting at four, I got a bail too. <laughs>